In the middle of the city, a young boy catches a spider and places it in a plastic terrarium. A beautiful priestess interrupts his arachnid fascination by placing both her hands on his shoulder. He turns around, looks up, and quickly backs away from this unfamiliar character. She then smiles at him and mysteriously places her hand on his head. The two are interrupted by a strong gust of wind, and she also disappears in a flash. Puzzled, he looks around his surroundings, then at himself, only to realize that the spider has gone missing. Fast forward to years later. Now older, he finally manages to complete his wood sculpture of a tree spirit. While he's settling down, the realization suddenly dawns on him. He's running late for school. He tries to carry the sculpture in his arms but fails under its weight. No more skipping gym day for him, I guess. As he rushes to school, an unusual sight stops him in his tracks. The tree spirit sculpture is now surrounded by thick tree roots all over the ground. An earthquake begins to rattle the earth, but something is obviously wrong here. The land itself is moving like a swarm of insects. Suddenly, the statue in front of him bursts open and reveals a girl with glimmering, long blue hair. Our boy hears in the shock of his life as his sculpture transforms into a dream fantasy waifu. It's like… it's like she's straight out of an anime. Oh, wait. Once poked on the face, the girl suddenly zaps into consciousness. She begins to take a look at her limbs. What is this well-sculptured form, she muses, clearly confused over her new body. As for our Mr. Green Boy here, he's clasping his head while crouching to the ground. Poor boy still processing the sudden turn of events. The girl assures him that there's nothing to be afraid of, leaving him to give her a how am I supposed to keep calm kind of look. Well, one thing's for sure though, he'll probably be skipping this school day since he's still at home, worriedly looking at this mysterious girl. The young man tells her that he has some things to ask, and the girl corrects him by mentioning that it's her who should be doing the asking. However, being the self-proclaimed considerate individual that she is, she'll allow him to go first. After all, ladies first is so last year. First things first, he brings up the fact that he's very sensitive to spirits. He wants to know if she's a supernatural manifestation like a tree spirit or something, and the girl is offended by this. She suddenly rolls up some newspapers, turning it into a lethal weapon. The girl demands to know if he thinks that she's some unrefined mountain demon, before smacking him straight on the side to drive away such sacrilegious thoughts. She can't believe her standing as a deity has been reduced to something so low. So she'll use this moment to bring him up to speed on the higher class entity in front of him. She begins the session by asking, Do you know what a guardian tree is for? All he knows is that it's a sacred tree. She clarifies that it's not just any sacred tree, it was THE sacred tree. It is the tree of an actual god, containing a vessel descended straight from the heavens. That god serves as a guardian of this material world and all the living things that emerge from it. That seemingly unreachable deity is none other than her, the mother of this world. The young man is baffled, to say the least. Can a god seriously just come out of a tree and have control over the universe's existence? But she doesn't answer him this time. It's her turn to do the questioning. What's this vessel I'm in? Seeing the confusion on his face, she clarifies that it's the one that's shaped to look like a human. The young man figures out that she's referring to his carefully crafted wooden sculpture. That's odd. Was the sculpture selected as a vessel simply because its materials were taken from a sacred tree? But wait, why does he have parts of the tree in the first place? The two rush to the side of the tree, while the goddess angrily reminds him that there will be punishment if he's lying. Once they arrive, she can only stand there in horror. The formerly grandiose sacred tree has been cut down to make space for a major urban land conversion project. Based on the town gossip, the tree will be moved to some other shrine. Pieces of the tree were discarded in its uprooting, and his friend snuck him a piece of wood which he used to carve his entry for the district exhibition. However, this wasn't a big surprise since he's familiar with the tree, even playing around the general vicinity as a child. Speaking of which, he faintly remembers that they've actually met here before. But before his memories fully materialize, she hits him with an amnesia-inducing divine punch the retribution! Oh well. The goddess starts screaming at him, calling him a criminal. How could they do this to a sacred tree? This is a heinous mutilation. She is furious and has no time for his wishy-washy trip down memory lane. The fact remains, humans desecrated the sacred tree during her slumber. The young man is weirded out by this. How could she have been asleep if they met years ago? The goddess tells him that she has no recollection of the encounter. She lays on the ground in surrender to this twisted fate as she says, Do you have any idea what will happen with the guardian tree gone? The land where people come to pay their respects to their god will lose its guardian. With a powerless god, the balance cannot be maintained and impurities will be left to inflict damage on an unprotected world. 
She breaks into tears, distraught over what would become of her beloved home. Disorder will inevitably take over with disasters widespread. She can only hope that a heroic individual will restore the balance. A centipede comes closer to her, and the young man's warning surprises her enough to make her fall over. As the centipede crawls on her leg, it emits a sinister aura. The goddess tells him that this is an example of an impurity. The things that were kept in check by the sacred tree are starting to roam free. She notices the worried look on his face and tells him that there's no point in concern because someone like him can't do anything. No human can touch impure objects. If they do, they also become irreversibly tainted. That is a fundamental and irrefutable law of this universe. The young man fails to heed her advice, carelessly picks it up, and throws it away. Disgusting! With that, the demon centipede dissipates into nothingness. The goddess looks at him wide-eyed, shocked, surprised, bewildered. A flurry of emotions rise within her all at once. In typical anime fashion, she gives him a strong kick to the face. How the hell did he just do that? Was that some sort of dark mystic art? Back at his home, the goddess hugs her legs in silence. The young man can only stand there and maybe offer her something to eat, obviously trying to figure out how to diffuse the tension and improve her mood. Seeing as she's not answering, he decides to just head out to grab some food. As he attempts to leave, the goddess suddenly speaks, As a deity, I have no defense against the impurities that plague this land. And worse, to lose face, being saved by a heathen. The young man rubs his chin and brings up that he stopped the insect at the very least. Protection is protection. She responds that all he did was return it back to the earth, but it will come back soon enough. Besides, people are usually incapable of touching impurities unless they underwent hellish and rigorous training. Can she be blamed for having suspicions? suspicions about his real identity? The young man lets her know that he was born with a strong psychic sense. That might be why he can do these things with no adverse effects to himself. The goddess isn't satisfied with this answer and lays on her side. She'll be needing some time to think about this, alone. This deep train of thought is rapidly derailed by what his eyes see. Looks like she's pretty blessed with gifts as well, but unwrapping them would be a tall task. The young man tries to focus his wandering mind on something else by turning on the television, but he accidentally stumbles upon an underwear commercial. The world is basically telling him to just give in to his corrupted thoughts by showing him things he can't have. As a relic of the ancient past, the goddess is fascinated by this TV. Whoa! Moving pictures! Curious about this magical box, the goddess quickly snatches the remote from the boy's hand so she can watch. It turns on to a magical girl anime. She instantly takes note of its theme. She then asks for some paper, a requirement to perform an exorcism at the site where the sacred tree was cut. The goddess admits that she'll be using the god's purifying power against them, but can't muster enough power in this form. An item will have to serve as an external substitute. She takes out a magical girl wand and declares, a pretty young girl, a god of the land, and a guardian spirit. I won't forgive the impurities. The streamers on my exorcist item gather the purifying powers of the gods, a powerful weapon to crush the enemy. She commands the young man to catch the impurities, and he does. With a swing of her exorcism wand, the impurities disappear in a flash. The goddess is relieved that her powers still work. All that's left is to purge the impurities in the name of love and justice. She finally puts her hand down for a shake and introduces herself as Nagi, sharing the same name as the tree. The young man returns the courteous act by wiping his hand on his shirt and mentioning his name, Jin Mikuria. The two amicably shake hands and a strong gust of wind blows right in. He starts looking around, thinking she's disappeared again. He then hears her voice call out to him and realizes she's just on her way back. Looks like they'll be living together from that day on. Unfortunately, Nagi has a taste for the finer things in life, and she asks for an expensive snapper fish. Jin wittingly picks out a red bean taiyaki that looks just like one. Technically, this is a snapper as well. It'll just give you diabetes. Nagi is at first reluctant, comparing it to her followers' offerings in the past. However, she takes a bite out of it and immediately falls in love with its flavor. Cheap grub can be good too. Jin asks her if she really has nowhere to go home to. With a full mouth, she tells him that she won't be going anywhere until the sacred tree is restored, additionally blaming him for sculpting the vessel she's in. Jin can't believe this, but Nagi is quick to accuse him of evading responsibility. Anyway, she's going to need his ability to help her cleanse impurities, so it's best she stays with him. She warns him that disaster will occur if nothing is done about it. Once done with her taiyaki, she switches on the TV and Jin's mind wanders off to less worldly issues for now. Despite being a goddess, she's still a cute girl who'll be living with him. Bao chicka wow wow! His thoughts and fantasies run amok in his head, his hormones raging more than a tilted child on Fortnite. He mentally pinches himself to stop his brain from running like a hamster wheel. As he stands up, Nagi reminds him of her godly protection, essentially guaranteeing his safety. 
After hours of mental exercise, hunger sets in. Jin heads out and buys a bento meal from the convenience store for dinner. As they're eating, he opens up about his father. He's currently away and that's why Jin's living alone. Despite this, he needs to prepare proper and believable excuses as to why a bombshell of a woman is staying over at his house. He turns off the TV in order to get her full attention and then lays out the ground rules of living under his roof. They'll need to agree on things like food, with an example being who will be the one preparing them, but since he's afraid of her lack of culinary skill, he'll be doing the preparations for now. He instructs her that she can't mess up something as simple as throwing the trash out, but she'll have to organize them properly, which is a lengthy discussion for another time. Nagi can't help but feel like Jin considers her a fool. He brews some tea so they can have something to drink as they discuss, but returns to her fast asleep on the ground. In this state, Jin cannot help but be aroused by her appealing figure. He slowly, carefully tries to wake Nagi up, but she swiftly gets up on her own anyway, and he pulls his hand back just as fast. If this was like 99% of other anime, that would have been a caught in 4K moment with his hand on the wrong place, ending with a scream and a slap. He points her to the bath to wash off her sweat. While Nagi enjoys the experience, Jin takes this opportunity to hide his dirty magazines in a box labeled as textbooks, which we swear isn't suspicious at all. Looking for a change of clothes posed another problem. Nagi doesn't have another set to change into. Jin reluctantly decides to wash Nagi's clothes with her approval, but having just one set of clothes is inconvenient. The young boy now has a shopping list that includes new sets of underwear. Put on a brave face, don't make eye contact, and just shop as fast as you can, Jin. Once he gets home, he finds her wearing his shirt that says, Sense of Shame. He anxiously asks her to change out of the shirt and stay put with the TV. One other reminder is to not answer the phone at all costs, since no one knows he lives with someone. Finally, he calms down and rests in the bath. The phone starts ringing, but he decides to just call back after his bath. He's too tired to be dealing with anything else right now. Just let it ring until all the rings run out. Silence. It stopped ringing. Early. That can only mean one thing. Jin hurriedly runs out, guns blazing in the nude. That's the last of his worries right now as he sprints like Usain Bolt trying to clear another world record. He manages to make it just in time to grab the phone from Nagi before she says anything. The girl on the other side of the line, Tsugumi, is worried about him because he missed class and, coincidentally, the deadline for the entries in the district exhibition. He tells her that he'll explain next time. It's not easy to say that your submission came to life. In a hushed voice, Jin tells Nagi to look the other direction due to his lack of clothing, and Tsugumi Yumi wonders if someone is at home with him. He responds that he's alone. Having imaginary friends at that age is kind of weird. After the call that almost compromised him, Jin reminds Nagi that she's not allowed to answer the phone. Hmm. Nagi thought phones were just those handhelds. He realizes his mistake and lectures her on the multiple types of phones. That night, he prepares a bed for her and tells her that she's not allowed to touch anything in the room, especially not the textbooks box. It takes a while before he falls asleep and he hears movement coming from the bedroom sliding door. Hmm. It seems like gods aren't spared from potty breaks. Jin wakes up and prepares their morning breakfast, finding himself nervous about knocking on Nagi's door. As he spends an eternity readying himself to talk to her, she opens the door and he clumsily gets pushed over. Nagi is upset that her wand broke after accidentally stepping on it while sleepwalking. She tells Jin to get her a new one that's higher quality this time, the kind that would be indestructible. Jin remembers the judgmental look he got when buying the magical girl wand and outright refuses, not wanting to relive the shame. Deciding to become more assertive, he hands her some glue and tells her to fix it instead. He also sends her out of the room as he'll be changing. She can begin eating the prepared breakfast sitting outside. As he cleans up and folds the futon she slept on, he gets a whiff of her scent on it. Jin blushes at this, but tries to eradicate the dirty thoughts from his mind. He exits the room to find Nagi's meal untouched, then hears her screaming for him at the top of her lungs. This alarms him enough to run to check on her, but it turns out to be just her freaking over some kittens. Oh Nagi, was that a cutesy overload? Jin probably sees you like you see those kittens by now. Nagi tells him that they should adopt the kittens, but Jin rejects this proposal since the mother might just be around. Other than that, he's just renting the place and pets are prohibited within the premises. As he takes his leave to get some money, he reminds Nagi to stay put and eat her breakfast. Can't they at least feed them milk? No, cats aren't allowed to drink ordinary cow's milk. Nagi starts speaking to herself in Jin's voice saying, Even if you had milk, you won't be able to feed them with that anyway. Jin wasn't even thinking of that, Nagi. Well, maybe just a little. She's terrified of them getting dehydrated, but Jin insists that she go back inside and just check on them regularly. To Jin, she doesn't feel like a god at all. Jin goes about his day and buys a couple of things for them at home. Once he returns, he notices that the magical wand is now stuck on the table because of the shoddy glue repair. Nagi's excuse is that her other personality did it. She even tries to cover it with a towel, but this doesn't lighten up Jin's mood at all. 
Outside the residence, a girl with red hair is worried about Jin being alone. She steals her resolve as his cute childhood friend to save the day. Before she can even ring the doorbell, she hears them fighting inside and is shocked by the sight of Nagi storming out of the house. Oh boy, what's that underwear you're holding, Jin? Just right after the girl asks, who are you? Jin quickly pulls Nagi back inside. Inside, Jin is upset that he was seen with Nagi. No one is supposed to see her, most especially his childhood friend Sugumi. He's worried that his dad probably even asked her to come over. If he finds out a girl came out of his house, and he had her underwear in his hands, Jin's dad would make hell look like a playground. Are you saying that I'm giving you a hard time? Nagi asks. You've realized just now? Jin responds, clutching on the strands of his hair. It looks like he'll have to explain what's going on to his friend, but make sure to leave the underwear behind. The two sit right across the magical wand glued table, directly facing each other with Jin trying his best to find the right words to explain his situation. Tugumi reassures him that there's no need to explain. She firmly believes she has no right to regulate Jin's choice of friends. However, if if this decision means that he'll be dropping out from school, then she doesn't know how she'll explain it to his dad. Nagi doesn't stay put, but sits in the room with them. She bows before Tsugumi and asks for forgiveness for her rowdy behavior. Nagi lies and introduces herself as Jin's stepsister. Way to make the situation more complicated. What draws more attention is this absolute display of good manners though. It shocks Jin and even Tsugumi is taken aback. It's like they're both talking to a completely different person. Nagi further explains that the girl Tsugumi encountered earlier is a different side of her. You see, the the strict and traditional family that raised her didn't even allow her to laugh out loud. Those harsh conditions led to the development of a split personality. Nagi is repentant for showing such a cold side of her. Tsugumi approaches Nagi, asking for forgiveness for misunderstanding her. Nagi continues her sob story by illustrating that her family no longer cares for her because they think she can only be a burden and nothing else. Jin is undoubtedly floored by this performance. Give her an Oscar already. While in the kitchen, Jin admits that he's impressed by her award-winning performance. She responds with one of the biggest twists. It's concrete proof that it wasn't her who stuck the wand on the table. Wait, it takes a while, but it finally dawns on Jin that her split personality explanation earlier might actually be true. Nagi tells him that she prefers it that the other, Nagi, doesn't know as it's better that way. As Jin walks Sugumi home, she admits that she's not surprised his father got involved with someone else like that. This is a clue to the personality of Jin's dad. Jin asks her if they can keep Nagi a secret. Tsugumi says she will. Besides, it's complicated to explain to other people. However, if something untoward or dangerous happens, then she might change her mind. Tsugumi is just here to watch over him after all. Bringing the conversation back to normalcy, she reminds him to eat the fried egg she cooked for him back at home. She turns to face the crossing and bids farewell, letting him know that she will see him soon. That evening, Jin struggles mightily to get the wand off the table. As Nagi is busy watching TV, he realizes that the wand can now only be taken off with glue removal solvent. Why is it even stuck so nicely at the middle? Nagi laughs at this and says while she was fixing the wand, it flipped several times and landed on the table cleanly. It was an awesome sight, extraordinarily so, that it made her laugh. Wait, why would she even la- What an absolute liar! She doesn't have a split personality. There was no hint of remorse for the hassle whatsoever. That evening, Jin sees a familiar striped cat dead on the road. He discovers that this used to be the mother of those kittens, but not anymore. That only means that no one is left to take care of those poor babies who will probably dehydrate and die. Jin quickly runs back home, wishing that he had actually listened to her. Once he arrives home, Jin finds the kitten's bodies in Nagi's arms. She mumbles under her breath, died of dehydration already. That that's just too unbearable. Yes, even hatred cannot be understood. I wish you make it to the next world. The sacred ground of the dead is too terrible for you. The lifeless kittens glow and enter Nagi's body. She turns to look at Jin and passes out. He tucks her in bed that evening. Before going to sleep, Jin makes sure to repair the wand but he cannot get the image of Nagi putting those kittens to rest outside of his mind. Suddenly, Nagi slides the door open and asks for food. He gives her some instant noodles because it's an awkward time of the night to cook. She isn't bothered by this because she finds it delicious. As she begins to slurp on the steaming noodles, Jin asks if those kittens are truly gone. She says that they are. It's all just too sad. He mentions them being absorbed into her and asks what it was for, especially since it almost felt like she was a completely different person, even fainting afterwards. Nagi shrugs his questions off and calls them irritating. She's a god. Sometimes she uses her powers. Done. Jin just wants an explanation to rationalize what he had just seen. Besides, he gives her food and was worried about her. Nagi, now annoyed, tells him to stop. She claims to have never even needed his help in the first place. Jin reminds her that if he hadn't cooked for her, she would starve. A hungry god is no god. She aggressively retaliated and called the food slop. Jin loses his patience. 
He tells her to get out and asks her why she's been acting so begrudgingly since yesterday. She's just impossible to handle. He doesn't care if she's a god, he's had enough. She goes back to the side of where the sacred tree once was and leaves her magical girl wand on the stump. Nagi grumbles at how rude he is in front of one of the guardian statues. She suddenly finds some of the children messing with her magical girl wand and goes after them. They ask her who she is and Nagi says she's a shrine maiden. The object in her hands is used to vanquish evil spirits. This dark-haired kid doesn't believe it, so he gets a good ear pinching from her. He panics and tells her that all they want is to go play games, so she can just leave them alone. If it's just games, Nagi thinks she should be able to play along. One kid is confused but has no problem with it. Nagi shuffles through the toys in the bucket, taking the ball which the boy refers to as a super ball. She makes a Dragon Ball reference. He tells her that it's not that kind of thing. He demonstrates by making it bounce very well. The pink-haired boy named Mibu says that he needs to go, clutching his stomach in pain. They ask if he's hurt anything. Mibu says it's not that. It's just that he hasn't been happy lately because his parents are fighting at home. One other kid confirms this, but another one argues with him not to bother Mibu about it. Mibu runs off revealing a black frog latched onto him, an impurity. Nagi calls out to him to stop so she can banish the impurity. Nagi explains to them that impurities are small nasty critters. This one in particular resembles a frog. She adds that humans come into contact with different kinds every day. These impurities feed on human emotions, attaching onto people and giving them bad luck. However, with the spirit wand in hand, Nagi believes it won't be a problem. After all, it contains a god's divine cleansing power. Nagi seems confident that she can cleanse the impurity without Jin's help. After all, she just has to swipe it for the critter to disappear. Or so she thought. This frog impurity starts jumping from place to place, invisible to the children. It merges into the ball and tries to escape using it as a vehicle. It flies right past Nagi and zooms off into the distance. She considers asking Jin for help but decides against it, due to their previous quarrel. She finally corners the impurity at what appears to be a dead end and tells it to bring on the fight. Now desperate, the ball starts flying erratically. It seems that being in a tunnel worked both ways. If she cornered it, then it also cornered her. The ball zooms towards her leg and leaves a bruise. That's like getting hit with a paintball. Ouch! The impurity speeds toward her a second time, but Jin appears to capture the ball with his hand. Badass! He heroically tells her not to go running off to places alone, then hands her the ball with the impurity and tells her to be done with it. She whips out her magical girl wand and exercises it with her god powers. Jin carries Nagi back home and brushes her up on some strategy. Next time, she could have just lured the ball into some grass, so it couldn't bounce as highly. He also comments that her reflexes aren't great, but he says this all while caring for her. Sweet, sweet Cinderez. Are you still angry? Nagi asks. Jin replies, Yes, but since I know what you're like, I let it go. I'm already used to your type. She asks him where they're going, to which he responds home. He already bought her a bowl, so she might as well make use of it. Why are you used to this type? It's because my dad is like that. She calls his father weird and he quips back that she's not the one to talk about what's weird. That would be more than a little hypocritical. Nagi then inquires, When you were young, were you also whacked on the butt by your father? Because, you know, weird fathers whack their children on the butt. The kids are still there waiting, feeling like they've been duped out of their ball. But hey, at least Mibu is feeling better. On their way to school, Jin thanks Sugumi for the meal she brought for him. She asks how they are and he praised the fried vegetables, of all dishes, which disappoints her. As Jin is painting, two girls start commenting on his choice of color and sudden lack of direction. The one with glasses even remarks that he can't sketch properly, and yet he has the audacity to use bold colors. The blonde agrees and says that oil painting is too advanced for someone like Jin. She calls him stubborn and the other remarks he's wasting too much paint. Jin finally responds, telling them that he knows he's not skilled but they interrupt him and mention that they know he just wants to learn from the newcomer, Daitsetsu. The girls go gaga over his speed and talent, calling his palette knife painting technique absolutely stunning. Jin cannot help but be annoyed by this. The revered reincarnation of Picasso, Daitsetsu appears beside him without warning and sits. He asks how his woodcraft has been going. Jin tells him that as it was nearing completion, he fell and broke it. Jin immediately adds that he feels bad since Daitsetsu was kind enough to bring that sacred piece of wood back to his home. The other student suddenly lends him a cute magazine called The Monthly Meow that makes him scream. A blonde student named Akiba gets annoyed by the sound. People like him are so focused on doing line art that having someone like Daitsetsu around ruins their workflow. Akiba is so quiet that people don't even notice his presence sometimes. The girls are impressed by his work and asks about which magazine he'll be submitting to next. The 
monthly deja vu. The girls comment that they've already seen manga like this before and it lacks originality. Of course, Akiba doesn't take these comments lightly. Jin asks Akiba why he's even in the art club when there's a manga club that exists at school. This triggers Akiba, saying he refuses to associate himself with any of those lowlifes. He tells Jin that he just hates how they talk about manga and anime without any passion. Apart from reading doujinshi, they barely even do anything productive. Of course, Jin knows that he's not interested in the typical anime, like Magical Girls. Akiba fires off like a Gatling gun, but this is a display of his flaming passion for the arts. The blonde Ishino is impressed with the new set of people in the art club since it has always been mostly females. They now have the hunky Daitetsu, the pure pure Jin, and the egotistical Akiba. What a unique, balanced mix of personalities. In fact, if this were an RPG, their party would be ready to fight the boss, says Takako, the girl in spectacles. Shino asks if she likes any of the boys, and she says that if she had to pick, it would be pure pure Jin. Is this a harem now? There's an air of frustration brewing within Jin regarding how he can't even put his ideas into paper. The others take notice. Daitsetsu reminds Jin that he's doing his best and the shorter boy uses this opportunity to say that he joined this club because he admired his friend a lot. Even though he might not make it big, Jin promises he will still try his best to surpass the others. This sends Takako into a nosebleeding frenzy. This is what she wants. Her pure pure boy who is both a friend and a rival. But of course, before the boss fight, the party needs to train. Takako and Shino assign the boys to clean out the storage room at the old club building. Jin reacts in an out-of-character terrified way, which is a fresh change from his usual self. This pushes the girls to ask if he's afraid of ghosts. Akiba tells them that it's the opposite, and Jin is actually great with ghosts. The scaredy cat quickly clarifies that he can only see them but not get rid of them. Every time they go to field trips, it's always shrines. That only means more spirits. And he's tired of it. Why does he have to see these additional attractions floating around? Daitsetsu uses this moment to ask a question. What would happen if a ghost touched a screen window? Would it pass through? This easily diffuses the tension. Such a funny weirdo. Tsugumi accompanies the trio to the horror movie-worthy old building and Jin can't even get himself to look at it. Daitsetsu calmly reminds Jin not to walk with his eyes covered. Akiba, conversely, is relaxed because he doesn't believe in ghosts. He reassures the group that there's nothing to be afraid of. As this is happening, Jin notices an impurity creep into a hard-to-reach space. Tsumugi shares with them a story she heard from a senior. A student fell to his death while climbing the ladder, which had a sharp rod at the bottom. Who even creates these traps in a school? Even after he was pierced through, the student was still conscious. He kept calling for help, but no one came. He eventually lost too much blood and died. But, not knowing he was already dead, it is rumored that passersby can still hear his cries for help. Akiba calls the story rubbish, because there's no ladder anywhere to be seen. Tsugumi points to the basement door. A hard slam suddenly reverberates from behind it. Everyone screams. They ask absolutely freak out. Despite not being a believer in spirits, Akiba panics and tells the two club leaders that he really heard a ghost in the storage room. Takako tells him to at least check out the cause of this jarring sound, but no one is willing to do it. At home, Jin is too tired to do anything and ends up lying face down. He wonders if that was actually an impurity, and if he should even tell Nagi about it. He's afraid that if he tells her, she'd want to go to the school. Nagi asks him if there's anything troubling him, and he does his best to hide it. Back in school, Jin is deep in thought, considering catching the impurity and bringing it back home. Akiba suddenly starts screaming for his name and then slaps his hand across his head. The usually composed Akiba is riled up because of a beautiful girl at school, who claims to be looking for Jin. Akiba swears that if this were a manga, Jin would be the main character. Well, hmm, I guess it kinda is true, but don't tell him that. Meanwhile, Nagi is being surrounded by admirers who call her a super beauty. People are surprised by the presence of a new student halfway into the term. At the sight of Jin, Nagi cheerfully calls for him, drawing the ire and jealousy of the rest of the boys. As she leaps to hug him, he dodges to the side. Bang! There she goes. People are shocked that he avoided her. Is Jin the person Nagi is looking for, the boys wonder? Nagi gets up from where she is and starts to tear up. Jin calls this little acting stunt of hers disgusting. Disgusting? Oh boy, these guys are fuming mad. How dare you insult their new goddess? Literally, but they don't know that. They call Jin an ungrateful and stupid man and speculate that he must swing the other way since he always seems to turn down cute girls. As he's dragging Nagi away, he makes it clear with them that she's only his relative, and this isn't some sweet home Alabama stuff. Ho oh, Jin, it seems like the trouble never ends. There's still so many impurities to take down, but this eventful life of fun is going to disrupt Jin's formerly peaceful life. Now with Nagi at school, it looks like this whole ordeal is about to ramp up into a whole new dimension. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.